Our next talk is titled Jack Hammer, Row Hammer and Cache Attacks on Heterogeneous FPGA CPU Platform. This talk has three researchers, Daniel, Tihor, and Zane. I'll quickly introduce them and hand it over. Uh, Daniel is a PhD candidate at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and some of his not noticeable research paper is on microarchitectural attacks like the spoiler, zombie load, and TPM fail, which was also presented at the last hardware. Tiho is a PhD candidate from the University of Lubeck, and his research area is FPGA security, and he also loves solving crypto challenges. Uh, Tiho, I hope you're also participating in our wall challenge contest. Zane uh, uh, is a PhD candidate also at Worcester Polytechnic. Uh, her research interests include computer microarchitect, digital hardware design, cryptography, and security. In her free time, she also enjoys rock climbing. All right, uh, so I see all three of you. Yes, and uh, over to you. Hi. All right, hi. Um, thanks for Hi. the introduction. Is, is the screen share working? For it's perfect. Yeah. perfect. All right. All right, then. Well, well, let's... Hi, guys. Uh, yeah, let's get us started. Yeah, let's get started. Yep. All right. So uh, we know that like cloud services are used everywhere, and we are so excited now with a new technology, which is like embedding these FPGAs into these cloud environments. Uh, well, you may know many of these cloud environments, but you may not know that many of them support FPGAs, so you can just go on them and rent some, uh, some, some uh, FPGA boards and then start you know, optimizing some of your application logics, like for example, for cryptography applications, for video rendering or machine learning, these FPGAs can be really useful for uh, executing things much faster. But in the age of Spectre and Meltdown, we know that whenever you have multiple users sharing hardware, even on the cloud, where you might think that uh, that separation between all of your operations is guaranteed, um, hardware security is actually a major concern. So what does hardware sharing look like on a modern FPGA and CPU system? Well, let, let's see if, yeah, it's true that uh, in the age of, uh, you know, Spectra and the if FPGAs are an issue really. So uh, in this work, we have studied two uh, FPGA platforms that are kind of similar, but they have different ways of uh, getting integrated to the system. And one of them is a integ integrated ARIA 10 FPGA that is on the same CPU die and it's directly connected to the memory subsystem. Uh, and the other one is the ARIA 10 FPGA, but as a uh, PCIe expansion card or shortly pack, uh, which is connected externally through the PCIe interface. Uh, so uh, these uh, basically these two platforms, of course, they have their own details that we're going to get into it uh, in a little bit uh, and explain it in more detail. Uh, but before I, I continue the rest of this talk, there are a couple of things to keep in mind uh, that uh, that matters for this research, basically. So one thing that we need to keep in mind that uh, is that we are trying to use FPGAs for some accel acceleration and we are sending data back and forth from the CPU to the FPGA. And each of these may have different addressing. So we are dealing with different addressings here. There is the virtual address space on the uh, CPU, the applications use that, and then there's the physical address space. But in some setups, the FPGA may also have its own IO virtual address, especially uh, the, the, these IO virtual addresses may be, uh, may be used. Uh, but if there is no IO MMU in between, these, these IO virtual addresses may just be the physical address. Uh, so when using IO MMU, these addresses are truly virtual. Uh, and if it's attached to a virtual mach machine, it's equal to the guest operating system physical address. Uh, the next thing that uh, to understand is that for uh, transferring data, uh, we need to share some memory pages between the CPU and the uh, 
and FPGA. And generally, it's uh, these memory pages are shared for it's like 40 kilobyte granularity, 40 kilobyte pages. But uh, to ease the DMA access, DMA operations, uh, we can also uh, allocate contiguous address spaces with bigger buffers, which is there are huge pages for two megabytes. So the FPGA can just use it to transfer data uh, with uh, larger space. And the last thing I also like to mention here that, uh, so we are dealing with uh, memory subsystem, there are caches involved. So uh, the behavior of the CPU and the FPGA when they read or write or flush the, me the memory caches is important. Uh, so during this talk, we will give some ins insight to the behavior of the, ca the cache uh, and which we ask you to keep in mind since you need to understand why basically Jackhammer performs uh, significantly faster than a software-based raw hammer. So let's get back to the platform that we mentioned. It worked. Uh, so basically the first understanding is that this Intel acceleration stack terminology or you know, trying to understand what, what does this terminology means that Intel use. So in this figure, you see the two platforms that we mentioned. On the right side, uh, you see the pack or the uh, programmable acceleration card, and that contains an ARIA-10 uh, FPGA and is also connected via the PCIe. The FPGA itself is, is, is divided into two regions, the blue region and the green region. So this blue region is like something that is programmed by the firmware and it's designed by Intel and provide maintenance functionality like programming the FPGA or providing sensor data for temperature or supply voltage. Uh, in addition, it introduces an abstraction la layer uh, that is called FPGA interface unit or FIU. And this abstraction unit basically uh, simplifies the available communication by buses and exchanging information between the, uh, between the FPGA and the cache memory subsystem. The cache memory subsystem has its own uh, subsystem that connects the CPU to this FPGA is called uh, Core Cache Interface Port or CCP, CCIP. And this CCIP is actually part of this blue region that uh, Intel has implemented these to uh, basically talk to the uh, CPU cache memory subsystem. The green region on the other hand is the actual parti part partial uh, reconfigurable region where a user hardware design is placed and Intel's basically calls a user's hardware region an acceleration functional unit or AFU here. On the left side, we have a similar uh, platform, uh, but this is integrated into the same CPU die and uh, the FPGA is connected here with two PCIe port and one UPI port. So in addition to PCIe, we also have a UPI connection. And what is UPI? UPI is, uh, is the acronym for the uh, universal uh, basically for the Intel fast bus system. And it's called ultra path interconnect that is tightly connected to the CPU and the, and the cache subsystem. So this blue region basically implement the protocol also to talk to that UPI. And then we have basically uh, here, another important thing is that this blue region now has its own cache here inside this uh, integrated platform. So, the next thing, as already we mentioned, so this integrated FPGA is included in the same packet as the CPU and the system we investigated have several cores uh, with in internal caches, L1 and L2 cache, but there is also the level three cache that is shared or it's the last level cache and any memory requests sent by the FT FPGA are primarily served by the cache if the data is available there, uh, but, uh, if the data is not available, the access is going to directly go to the DRAM. And the other important thing is that the software side, we have the operating system and uh, this, there is a software SDK that Intel is called Open Platform Acceleration Engine. And this gives us some, uh, some API on the Linux kernel and the software to actually uh, send our program beta streams to these FPGAs and execute them or allocate some memory for them. Uh, for for the operations. So 
So we also, as mentioned, this uh, CCIP or the core cache interface port that is implemented by the blue region uh, to understand that better. Uh, so the idea is that this uh, CCIP is exposed to the AFU uh, to be used for communication. So when you program an AFU logic, you use the CCIP like as some sort of uh, hardware API to communicate to to, to, the, to the CPU. Uh, there are two types of communications available here. One is the memory mapped IO or just memo, MMIO and the other is uh, DMA. And uh, the idea is that for with MMIO can be used to basically access and read and write to registers that are exposed uh, by the FPGA. So in uh, addition to, to you know, setting up the beta stream, the drivers also can identify available AF using the system by reading their uh, metadata and also find the mapped uh, registers that are mandatory and then you can read and write to those registers with MMIO. But if you wanna uh, also send lots of data for turn back, you can use the DMA here and this way the FPGA can receive or send bigger chunks of data from or to the CPU. And uh, while all these communications run over PCIe, the FPGA can configure the communication channel to be used for DMA. So the addresses provided by uh, DMA operation in general are IO virtual addresses, but all our setup at the time when we did this re research, uh, basically for DMA, uh, this was not true and in, even on Intel Labs, the virtual platform they provided us, the DMA accesses were, were using direct uh, physical address. So uh, according to the documentation of CCIP, uh, basically uh, the AFUs can provide some caching hint to talk to the, uh, to send this DMA request and you know, copy data. And for DMA reads, when you read, read data, there are two, two hints, one invalidate and share, which invalidate means uh, you just read the data and uh, invalidate the previous cache line, but with share, you read the data and you also uh, leave the cache line there uh, to be shared. For memory writes, there is similar invalidate and write, but there is additionally uh, an, another hint that is called uh, write push invalidate. And the idea is that uh, the, you can ask the CPU to cache the data in the LLC, but invalidate it from any uh, internal FPGA cache. Uh, the other important thing is all these caching hints are available for the integrated FPGA platform, uh, but for the external PCA platform, only the invalidate uh, hints are available. So you cannot, you have less visibility to modify the behavior of the cache from there. So it seems like the FPGA has a lot of control over what's going on in the different caches. Um, so that might be a concern if you're worried about cache attacks. So let me give you an overview of a couple of important types of cache attacks. Um, the first is a flush and reload attack. So we might be able to actually apply this in this scenario. Um, in a flush and reload attack, the attacker on the left requires a flush instruction and the ability to precisely measure um, a memory access time. And so uh, the attack then, and also you need a shared memory here between the attacker and the victim for a flush and reload. So this attack works in three steps. Uh, first, the attacker flushes the shared memory so that it removes it from the cache. Then the attacker waits and the victim might um, access the shared memory from the cache during this time. Um, finally, the attacker accesses the memory and times it. So if the, uh, if the second access now is fast, then the victim has already accessed this memory. It was present in the cache. If it's slow, the victim did not access this memory, so it was not present in the cache. So now the attacker has figured out whether or not the victim has accessed this shared memory. Now, in cases where the attacker and victim don't share memory, or if the attacker has no access to a flush instruction, flush and reload isn't an option. Um, but instead, the attacker might launch a prime and probe attack, which is a little bit more uh, versatile. So for prime and probe, the attacker first needs to collect an eviction set, um, which is basically a set of addresses which, when accessed, completely fill a cache set that the attacker wants to monitor. So again, this works in three phases. First, the attacker primes the cache set. 
So the attacker accesses the whole eviction set, loads up this cache set with its memory. Now the attacker waits again, and the victim once again might access the memory that they're using. Um, so that would actually then remove one of the elements of the eviction set that the attacker um, just filled the cache with. So finally, the attacker probes the cache again, um, uses the whole eviction set, and times, the, uh, times how long it takes to, to access the, the eviction set. So if the attacker sees a, a fast access time, then the victim did not access this cache line and did not evict one of the elements of the eviction set. If it takes longer, then the attacker knows that the victim accessed this memory that the attacker is monitoring. Right. So, so um, do these attacks actually pose a threat here to the CPU FPGA system? Uh, yeah, let me say this directly, yes. Um, so we had a look at what an FPGA-based attacker can do. And we will first focus on the scenario where the attacker has DMA access via PCIe. This scenario is applicable to the integrated FPGA and the pack, and we assume the victim to be located on the CPU in this case. So uh, we started off by measuring access times to see if an attacker can distinguish different locations of a cache line. Um, to do so, we realized the timer on the FPGA by incrementing a register at every clock cycle. And this, is, this is similar to uh, measuring timings on the CPU using thread counters, but we have the advantage here that our timer runs uninterruptible in parallel to all other operations performed on the FPGA. We used the timer to measure access times to addresses we placed in the last level cache and main memory. And as you can see in the histogram, we have two distinct peaks for the two locations. And even though they are close together, we found that requests served from the last level cache are clearly distinguishable from those coming from the DRAM because the timer is very precise and our uh, and, and outliers occur rarely if the last level cache serves the request. So now we also have to focus on the UPI case. And this scenario obviously is only available on the integrated FPGA because only that one has UPI access. And in contrast to the previous measurements, we now expect to see three distinct peaks because we have the additional cache in the FPGA. So when using UPI, uh, we can in fact see three distinct peaks also, we can see that the FPGA cache has a constant answer time without outliers. This is because the cache is part of the blue region and the preciseness of our timer. And the other peaks are really slim as well uh, because uh, the UPI bus has a very high bandwidth and also the system load during the measurements was really low. Together with the PCI scenario, this is an important find on the way to running cache attacks against the CPU since we can do the required measurements for the third step of flush and reload and prime and probe. However, we still either need a flush instruction or some way of priming the last level cache to perform an actual attack. And even though we can send DMA requests via UPI on the integrated FPGA, we cannot directly send UPI messages since we are bound to the CCI port. Because of this and the fact that the FPGA does not offer a flush instruction directly, an FPGA attacker cannot run flush-based cache attacks, but has to rely on eviction-based attack techniques like prime and probe. However, during the previous measurements, we also found that DMA reads do not alter the location and address is cached at. So we were digging deeper and analyzed the caching hints the CCIP gives us control over. We especially hope for the right push and validate flag here because it's supposed to load data directly into the last level cache. Um, in this plot, you can see a histogram of CPU access times to addresses that were previously written to by the FPGA using DMA writes with the caching hint set to write line invalidate. This flag is supposed to invalidate the cache line and write it to main memory directly. To give you a relation, we included the histogram for a common memory access denoted with MA in black. As you can see, access times to addresses that were written via PCIe are smaller than one would expect when accessing DRAM. And it turns out that these were served by the last level cache instead. This is also true for most accesses to addresses that were previously written to via UPI. But in this case, some timings are also higher than one would expect, uh, than, what one, than, what would one, than what you would expect uh, when, it, when it was served from the DRAM. 
So the caching hint does not lead to the expected behavior, but rather behaves like what we expect to see with the right push and validate flag. And we tested the other caching hints as well and found a similar behavior. So from this experiment, we state that caching hints for the write requests are not properly implemented at the time of writing. Independent of the provided caching hint, the data nearly always ends up in the last level cache. And this might sound like, a, like good news because we were searching for a way to prime the last level cache. However, it turns out that our behavior or the behavior we see is not caused by the caching hints or caused by the FPGA at all, but instead we see a CPU feature called data direct IO or DDIO for short. And um, this is used by peripherals to directly write to the last level cache, but it's outside of our control. And since DDIO in its default configuration can only, only allows us to write to 10% of the ways per cache set in the last level cache, this makes mounting cache attacks against the CPU harder. It's not impossible, but it makes it harder. So uh, let me just provide a proof of concept of the channel we found here by constructing a covert channel to send data from the FPGA to the CPU. Our covert channel works like the primate probotech, but with the victim willingly sending data in this case. To set this up, we had one software process construct an eviction set for a specific cache set in the last level cache and monitor it like an attacker would in a primate probotech. The FPGA on the other side writes to an address that maps to the same cache set whenever it wants to send a one and it stays quiet whenever it wants to send a zero. And this way the software receives either a one when it sees an increased probe latency and it will receive a zero otherwise. To ease decoding, we had the FPGA send with half the speed the software was probing. And this obviously results in two probes per bit. Also the FPGA uses repetition encoding by sending each bit three times to reduce transmission errors. You can see the resulting software measurements in the upper plot. And we can see that each peak is followed by a slope because of the second probe. And there are always three peaks for a one because of the repetition encoding. On the bottom, you can see the decoded signal. And um, yeah, it works pretty well. And we get a very good throughput of 94.98 kilobits per second. However, uh, this could be increased by a factor of six if we would not use the repetition encoding and not send uh, with half the speed. So in general, our measurements show that an FPGA-based attacker can mount eviction-based cache attacks against the CPU um, because the last, level cache is, the last level cache is shared. Of course, there are more new attack scenarios here. The CPU might detect the FPGA or we could have multi-tenant FPGAs where one hardware design attacks the other. Um, we also looked at those, but to not go over time, I will only give you the results without the details. So a CPU-based attacker can use flush and flush or flush and reload against the FPGA. And in the FPGA against FPGA case, eviction-based attack attacks work. Um, let me also add that the FPGA cache is directly mapped, which makes eviction set finding trivial. Well, very, very interesting uh, description, Tore. Uh, so I think, uh, the boiler point here is that in the scenario from the external PCIe where we don't modify the cache, we actually may benefit to do other attacks, which raw hammer, for example, is an attack that may benefit from that behavior. So we have our jack hammer attack, which is like a stronger raw hammer that is an implementation of a raw hammer exploits that run on Intel FPGA and it, it can attack the host main memory by just bypassing the cache and directly doing lots of memory access. To, so to understand how this works and why it's effective, let's first look at raw hammer attack in general. So raw hammer attack relies on basically an attacker and, uh, and a victim uh, that they share uh, some memory banks and the attacker basically tries to access the memory that is physically close to the memory rows of a victim. So. I'll get into how memory is laid out in a minute, but the idea behind raw hammer is that the attacker access one address uh, that is close to the victim row and then the other ones, uh, like for example, here we first access the top one, the bottom one, and then we keep repeating that. And by doing that, we cause one of the bits in the victim row to actually flip or change. 
and why flipping this bit is a problem. Well, the, when, when the victim access that memory, then that data is, is corrupted or manipulated. So that causes some integrity problems so you can modify a victim's data. And what's going on on a Rohammer attack? Well, uh, what's happening is that first the attacker has to allocate and identify some memory that is located close to the victim. And uh, by that, it means that the memory is organized to banks and each bank has some number of rows and the memory read and writes access these rows. So at the hardware level, uh, by targeting one row at a time, so, so basically we can cause a victim row to do bit fully. And the other important thing is that every physical address is statically mapped to certain rows and banks by some, some algorithm like XORing certain bits of the physical address. So here we don't have any problem doing that, that because the FPGA can directly use the physical address to access the memory. So that makes the attack much easier. And the corruption of data is actually happening due to some electromagnetic effect of these bits because we are helping the victim row to discharge uh, is uh, capacitors faster. So uh, the idea is that each bit of memory in the DRAM is stored in a capacitor uh, and the capacitor is gated by a transistor and the voltage stored in this capacitor determine whether the bit is, read, is zero and one. Uh, these transistors allow a little bit of current to pass through the capacitor. So even when the memory is not being directly written or written. So it's the responsibility of the memory controller to eventually after every few milliseconds to uh, basically refresh the concept of these capacitors. So, uh, and for example, on many systems, this refresh rate is 64 milliseconds, but one way to actually mitigate this uh, draw hammer attack is to re reduce the refresh rate like to uh, 32 or 16 milliseconds. And by doing that, you of course lose some performance because the memory controller will be busy uh, doing these refreshes, but it actually provide a, a little bit better protection against uh, raw hammer. But here also, uh, the raw hammer uh, attack can also, if it's if the memory accesses are performed faster, then the refresh rate become also uh, not that important as a mitigation. So raw hammer has been shown to work on DDR3 and DDR4 memories. Uh, people have shown that it can be, uh, it can attack at the ECC memory or uh, Wusek team has shown that it can even uh, bypass some of the mitigation like TRR. But for the purpose of demonstration of comparison here, we did the attack on DDR3 and we showed that, okay, jackhammer performs better raw hammer compared to a normal uh, raw hammer on the same DRAM modules. All right, so let me get into um, the details of this implementation of raw hammer. So jackhammer is our implementation of raw hammer that's mounted from the FPGAs um, against the the main memory of the CPU. So with just a little bit of assistance from the CPU in allocating those memory pages to begin with, um, then the entire attack runs from the FPGA against the host CPU's memory. So let's get into the performance of this attack compared to a CPU row hammer attack. So on the left, you can see um, a comparison of the distributions of hammering rates. So on the left column of the left graph, you can see the rate of the ARIA-10 pack running our jackhammer versus the uh, right column of that graph is its host CPU, um, an i7 IV bridge. You can see that the um, jackhammer runs, a jackhammer can send twice as many um, memory accesses per second at a very consistent rate. Um, so then on the right, you can look at um, what actually, uh, you can look at how many um, flips each of these causes in the victim row. So in many cases, jackhammer can flip four times as many bits per second as a CPU row hammer attack on the same system. So what makes jackhammer this much more effective? Well, um, as Daniel explained, row hammer is based on these nonlinear effects. So in every row refresh interval, the attacker is trying to push the bit voltages in the victim memory um, further and further from the correct value. Um, but at the end of every refresh interval, the row is refreshed and voltages are reset in every capacitor. Um, so just doubling the rate of memory accesses can make the chance of a bit flip during each refresh interval 
um, quite a bit higher. But then we kind of have to go back to, well, what makes the FPGA um, access the memory so much faster? Um, and so we've hinted at this already, but the answer is caching, or more specifically, not caching. Um, because the FPGA, when the FPGA reads memory, it doesn't place a new entry in the CPU's last level cache. Um, the CPU, of course, caches all of the memory that it accesses in its caches, by default at least. So for Rowhammer to work, the CPU has to flush every address between memory accesses, but the FPGA has no such limitation. So let's remove that limitation for the CPU and see what happens. Um, in this graph, you can see the hammering rates with and without memory caching on the pack and on its host CPU. So in the left column, you have with caching the pack, and then in the next column with caching on the CPU, you can see that Jackhammer runs twice as fast as the CPU. And then in the right two columns, you can see with caching disabled, the um, Jackhammer runs a bit faster, but the CPU can almost catch up to it. Um, and that really is just because the, uh, the cache is out of the way and the CPU no longer has to waste time basically running these flush instructions, um, which don't actually help produce the, the jackhammer, or they don't actually produce the row hammer effect. Um, it's just things that it has to get out of the way between memory accesses. But, but how do all these performance matrices really help for a practical attack? I mean, we still have to deal with random bit flip locations, right? Well, let's, uh, let's show the impact of attack on a practical, uh, practical uh, crypto attack. So in 1997, three researchers from Belcore Lab proposed this fault injection attack on RSA uh, based on the RSA CRT implementation of uh, RSA digital signatures. So the idea is that when you use the RSA CRT, you compute a signature from a message by using a private key that contains a prime number P, a, a prime number Q, and two private exponents called DP and DQ. The, there is also a modulus N, which is uh, P, the prime P times Q, and this modulus N is public. And to compute the signature, the RSA CRT computes to intermediate value S, P, and S, Q, and then it combines them with this magic formula to get the final signatures. So, this, uh, the nice thing about this Belcore attack is that the Belcore attack assumes a very generic fault attack model. So if during the computation of either SP or SQ, which are really the big numbers, any fault happens at any place, then this leads to a faulty signature S prime. And then the next thing we can do is by subtracting this S, S and S prime, which is we have a valid signature and an invalid signature, then we're gonna get a result, which is the multiple of either the prime P or Q. This is of course very simplified because of uh, you know, uh, the sake of this presentation, but the idea, the final idea is that we can compute one of the prime factors by just computing the greatest common divisor of the difference of a faulty and valid signatures and the value N. And we showed that this is probably possible with Jackhammer. Yes, yeah, so we constructed a fault injection attack with Jackhammer against the RSA uh, CRT signature in the WolfCrypt library. Um, we reported this vulnerability and it was fixed in December 2019. Um, so in our attack, the victim sets up an RSA key with WolfCrypt and the attacker allocates shared memory that the FPGA will use. Um, so the FPGA then runs the attack by repeatedly accessing the memory and flipping one of the bits um, in that intermediate value in the RSA key. Um, so in the best case, with the standard row refresh rate of 64 milliseconds, Jackhammer caused a fault an average of 25% faster than the CPU row hammer attack. Um, but with the refresh rate doubled, um, Jackhammer was 185% faster. So with that most common um, defense in place, um, we see much better performance with the you know, better speed of, of Jackhammer. We took a couple of shortcuts in our setup of this attack, um, but they don't affect these performance measurements. The first is that we manually located the memory to be used by the attacker and the victim. So realistically, the attacker um, isn't, you know, directly controlling the memory that the victim is using, but you can use a technique called page spraying, which is basically allocating and deallocating memory pages 
um, and trying sort of leaving a gap open for um, the victim to allocate their memory in. Um, and you can also assist page spraying techniques um, by using cache attacks to monitor the memory usage of the victim. Um, the other simplification that we make is we directly flush the memory used by the victim program. Um, because the faults in, in a row hammer attack occurs in the DRAM, the victim has to then read that memory from DRAM and not from the cache. So realistically, you would have to use an eviction set um, to force the memory out of the cache and cause the victim to, to read from memory um, to actually read that faulty value. Pr pretty impressive. So let me sum up everything. Uh, we identified and verified timing leakages in the Area 10 platform and we analyzed the behavior of caching hints. We used this to construct a covert channel from the FPGA to the CPU that reaches 94.98 kilobits per second. And we showed that FPGAs accelerate row hammer performance by 25%, which we used then to demonstrate a fault injection attack against the RSA CRT implementation of Wolf SSL, resulting in the CVU you can see on the screen. Um, yeah, at this point, we would like to thank our advisors, Berg Sunar and Thomas Eisenbart, as well as Evan Castodio and Alba Trivedi from Intel for their huge support in pushing this project. Um, thanks for your attention. Feel free to read our paper for more information or just ask your, quest ask your questions. Um, we will happily answer them. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Kiho, Daniel, and Zane. Uh, Audience, if you have any questions, please send them across via the Zoom chat. I see there was one question, but that's already been answered. Uh, the blue region and also Daniel has responded something. Uh, any questions did you, any one of you receive in the privately on the Zoom chat? Uh, no, no questions uh, here. Daniel, could you also uh, send in the link for this paper? It's it's amazing. I think it will help a lot of people as well to refer to it. Uh, yeah, sure. That would be helpful. I followed initially, but then after that, it got too scientific with all the maths and then the only word I could understand is hammer, hammer, hammer. That's it. Nothing else. Yeah, we try to keep it simple, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Great. So I, I oh, think here. there's kind of a question in the chat. Um, it needs an FPGA to be attached to the victim machine. Yes, that's right. Um, and usually this is not the case unless you rent a cloud server, right? That's, that's why we um, showed all the cloud service providers logos in the very beginning. All those cloud service providers, they rent FPGAs to their customers. And it might be the case that some victim is running a virtual machine on the very same server, so the very same hardware without knowing that there's actually an FPGA attached to the physical hardware system. And if you can rent this system or the FPGA on this system, then you might be able to um, either monitor the cache, the behavior of the victim in the cache, or you may cause faults in the in the victim's RAM by using the Rohem attack. All right, so, so someone else asked if there's um, physical changes in RAM for mitigation of Rohammer. Um, yes, there actually, there already are. Um, in DDR4 in particular, um, DDR4 in general is quite a bit more resistant to row hammer than DDR3. Um, there's a really a lot of DDR3 chips that are very vulnerable, um, but it's a bit, quite a bit harder to find a DDR4 chip that is vulnerable to row hammer. Um, and there's, so there's a couple things. One is um, manufacturers are just aware of this now. And so my guess is that there are, um, you know, there, there's wider margins of error in uh, just in, in the chip process, right? Because the, uh, this is very much an analog effect um, so you have just the uh, the voltage ranges, the amount of current leaked, whatever. All of these things need to be taken into account um, when you're you know designing um, when you're designing DRAM, right? And then the other thing is what's called targeted row refresh, which basically it looks for. This is actually a hardware feature implemented within the DRAM chip, um, although it's also 
people have experimented with software implementations as well. But basically, you, you monitor memory um, accesses, and you say if there's a certain number of memory accesses to a particular row in a short period of time, then automatically refresh the nearby rows um, because that high number of memory accesses is causing those other rows basically to deteriorate more quickly, right? And so you just need to get that memory refreshed more quickly before um, a bit flip actually happens. But of course, there's also, um, there's been some work on um, getting around target row refresh. Um, so there's trespass, which is T-R-R-E-S-P-A-S-S, -S -S, um, came out last year. And then there's some other work with um, Rowhammer using accessing more addresses and in different access patterns between the addresses to confuse um, TRR. All right, uh, we can take one more question uh, and then the rest we could keep it open in the breakout room if that's okay with you. So pick right. any one of the questions. I, I think there are about three or four questions lined up still. So the next so, question is, is this because of the cache or any other, the, the fact that the jackhammer is more stable or faster, is it because of the cache or, or anything else? Uh, because we are assuming the FPGA and the CPU share the same memory controller. Is that right? Yeah. You can um, go ahead and answer say, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so they, do, they do actually um, share the same memory controller. When, there is, when those requests come in over PCIe, um, those, those get passed through the various PCIe complexes and then to the memory controller. Um, my understanding is there's kind of two reasons. One, yes, there's, uh, there's fewer caches to, to check, right? So if, if the, let's say that the, the memory is in RAM, right? So you will hit the RAM eventually. Um, the CPU checks the level one and the level two cache um, and the, the last level cache before it hits the memory. The FPGA just hits the um, just hits the last level cache. The CPU also has a few extra layers. The CPU has to translate from uh, virtual to physical addresses, whereas the FPGA might not. Um, and then also the CPU has to deal with, um, you know, if there's other threads running, if there's other processes, right? There there can be lots of other. There's more things happening on the CPU, right? Besides. Um, you know, before you even reach the last level cache. Whereas from the FPGA, it's very straightforward unless you have, you know, maybe if you had another device that's using up the PCI lanes, um, you might be able to see some contention there. But if that's the only PCI device, um, there's not really anything else happening in the way of, but any, it, not, not anything else happening between the memory subsystem and the FPGA logic. All right, uh, thank you guys.